I'm grateful to get the chance to have a discussion with Gadan Lev. Gadan, originally born in Czechoslovakia, is a Holocaust survivor who lost 26 family members in the Holocaust. I've read books and created many paintings around the topic, so talking to a survivor is fascinating to me. Gadan also survived two bouts of cancer, co-wrote a book with his life partner, Julie Gray, moved to Israel in 1959, served in the Israeli army, fought in the Six-Day War, and on top of all of this, today, at the age of 86, Gadan runs a successful TikTok account that has over 250,000 followers. So with all of that, I'd like to introduce Gidan Lev, and it's so nice to meet you. I hope I covered the um, proper highlights about you, Gidan, but please go ahead and fill in anything that I've missed as you introduce yourself. All right, so as uh, you heard, I'm Gidon Lev, and it's pronounced, by the way, uh, Gidon, the emphasis on the second syllable, and because it, in the meaning of Gidon uh, is actually strength, koach, on is also, but never mind, that's secondary. What I wanted to also say is um, in 1959, when I arrived in Israel, I didn't go straight into the army. I first joined the kibbutz in the Jezreel Valley called Kibbutz Hazorea. And after a year, I was drafted into the army, like every uh, new uh, immigrant, if they were in the right age, they had to join the army. At that time, army service was two and a half years. And I did my basic training. I became a corporal, then I uh, commanded a platoon actually on a kibbutz uh, on the Lebanese border while the Lebanese border was a wonderful, quiet, peaceful place. And here I am today. I first found out about you on TikTok and I was just kind of perusing TikTok and I was so used to seeing very young people on there kind of dancing and joking around and, and doing skits. So when I saw you, I was really taken aback. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> here you were. Um, you see, I'm an, I'm a, what, what would, we, would you say? I'm a young 86. That's yes. all. <laughs> <laughs> you really are a young 86, but even to see anybody older than the age of 22 <laughs> and talking about such a serious topic as anti Semitism and the Holocaust, it was just all, it really stopped me in my tracks. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to begin our conversation by talking about TikTok, since that's where you are in your current day. And I, I was really wondering what inspired you to start the account. Okay, so very good question. And uh, also I want to make here something very clear. The idea and the work and the creativity does not stem from me. It stems from my partner, Julie Gray, whom I have been together with over four and a half years. She edited my book or book that we actually wrote together, not only about the Holocaust, but actually about my life in general, because it was full of all kinds of things that happened to me during my 86 years plus living. And she has to receive the full credit. She is the creator, she is the innovator, and she is the woman and the person behind the whole idea of uh, going on TikTok. One of the reasons, perhaps even the starting point was that, we wanted to advertise our book in one way or another. And we thought this might be a way of doing it. And we were quite right. It is, and we are selling great many more books. And we think our book is good. Kirkus uh, Publishing also thought so. 
and they actually uh, uh, chose our book as one of the best books of 2020. And we have a stamp on the book on every book that uh, is uh, published by them. Well, I just myself just finished reading it and I really did enjoy it. I actually read it in probably less than two days. Um, wow, that's yeah. sad. <laughs> when I get that into something. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's a good sign. Because if you get into a book and you can read it so quickly, that means that it's caught you. And I love reading books, especially books that I can't put down. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, yeah, and, and you're right. It really talks about not just the Holocaust, um, but, but your whole life and your life choices and, and your romances and just everything about you. I really feel like I know you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, okay, well, so the, the origi original reason for starting the account was really to introduce your book, but um, I, you know, I follow you on TikTok, and so I see the different, the different videos that you make, and so can you really just explain how it's gone beyond talking about the book and, and what else you're talking about and how you, how you really do make your choices, your creative choices? Okay, I think you're quite right. The, the, let's say the spark, the idea was the book. But once we got into it and it developed, it sort of snowballed and we also realized that we can do a great deal more than just wanting to sell the book. That is, we hardly ever mention the book or very rarely now. Mm -hmm. But we got into, into, TikTok, when we saw there's so much hate, so much violence, so much anti Semitism that we said, you know, maybe, just maybe, because of who we are, who I am, what my history is, we can have here some little effect on a few people around the world about Jews. Nonviolence, um, living it, living in the future, living today, um, and preventing anything and everything like the Holocaust from ever happening again. Yeah, well, and it it is definitely uh, caught on, as you can. Uh, as you said yourself, we have, I think, around 250,000 followers, which is not a million, but it's not bad. It's not easy. <laughs> to it's get not that easy followers. either. <laughs> and and no. you know, what really strikes me, too, is not only is it not easy for anybody to get that many followers, but um, it's not easy for somebody talking about the topic that you're talking about. So what do you think it is about you that is connecting so well with younger people? What is the special, the special factor, do you think? Not a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think it is the fact that, um, As a Holocaust survivor, I'm not constantly and consistently um, being down and, and without hope and, and suffering. I'm just the very opposite. The very fact that I went through the Holocaust and probably after the Holocaust, and after uh, planning and then coming to Israel and raising a family and uh, making a living and just living from day to day in, a, in an area that is not terribly peaceful, kept me constantly and almost consistently positive and and hopeful, and I think young people, especially 
in today's uh, world, it feels good. Here's an old guy who, who did this and got through this and got through this and cancer and schmancer and this, and he still is laughing and still can take jokes and still can say, there is a future, don't give up. Yeah. And I think that's what caught or has caught the imagination and the, and the attention of a lot of people, especially young people. I'm, and I'm thrilled, truly. Yeah. I, it's, it's totally a surprise to me. That's, that's a great answer that I never would have thought would be your answer. <laughs> and, um, and I think it actually inspires anybody, not just young people, but people of any age. That's, that's an inspiration to see a person like that. Well, yeah, you, you know, you know, my subtitle on, on, on our book is uh, Holocaust Survivor, uh, Rascal, and the, what is the third one? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> and the reason a rascal is because it's true, you can't put me very easily into a box. I'm out of the box. Right. And I love to do that. I mean, what is this whole business of, of, of uh, rascal? I am not afraid to try different things a different way. I'm not terribly afraid to break the rules here and there. Hopefully, not always just to get a, a parking ticket, but <laughs> because I park in a place I'm not allowed to. But the fact is, yes, that is part of my nature. And uh, I think people, uh, it, it, so many of us live in, in such a regulated way, in a regulated uh, uh, country or, or under certain rules that from time to time to feel that ah, I can try this. It may not be exactly what everybody does, but why can't we do, do it differently? Right. And that is part of me. Yeah, which is very, very engaging and very likable. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe when I first met Judy, she saw it in the first or second time we met. Because, you know, here I, I was looking for an editor for my book. I had written, I hadn't written a book. I had written my life story, which included also a section, of course, on the Holocaust because it was part of my life. But uh, I think she caught on that uh, this old guy, well, he, he's a twinkle in his eye and uh, there's something something there. And here we are four and a half years later. <laughs> and um, I'm so, so lucky to have this lady in my life. Oh, I can't even so explain. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, since we are talking about positivity, and, um, and you had mentioned how much hate and anti-Semitism is going on currently in the world, and, and I myself have seen it on TikTok, how do you deal with the negative comments, the anti-Semitic comments, which surely must, must come through in addition to the positive comments? So how do you deal with that personally? Well... Two, two, two ways. First of all, uh, Julie uh, censors or goes, doesn't let me see the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. She gets rid of it. Some of it that she doesn't get, it, I, can, I can take, I, I know there are terrible people around the world. I try to swim around and find the good people. Mm -hmm. From time to time, I do find them. And I know there are, but I also know there's some terrible people out there, not only here in America, not only in America, but in, in Israel too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a, a conflict area. You know that, I know that, I feel it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it, it can be solved. I can, I strongly believe that we must, will, and find solutions to the problems that exist, not only all over the world, but specifically here, right here in Israel with our uh, Arab citizens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Well, and I will point out to people that uh, you know the, there are many times that I have to uh, uh, deal with comments about what about the Palestinians? Yes, the Palestinians are here and they exist. And sooner or later, probably later, we will have to solve this problem in some way that both the Palestinians and the Israelis can live side by side and make this a wonderful place. It already is, but we can make it better. Right, sure, sure. Well, all of this is something else that struck me as interesting about you because, um, you know, as a person who wasn't alive during World War II, but I've read a lot about it. And now there has been this big uptick in anti-Semitism in the past few years all across the globe. So I feel like you um, in particular must be a person with a very unique perspective because you, you have lived through both time periods. And um, so I really wanted to know, first of all, why do you think there's been such a big increase in anti-Semitism in the past few years? What would you attribute it to? Well, it's a tough question to answer. I'm not sure I have the right answer. I have the, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure about this. I don't think anybody can be. But part of it, I think, is because um, in general, the world has opened up more. The, uh, the fact of computers and telephones, I mean, uh, even six, seven, eight years ago, I, I, I remember this distinctly. I was driving a taxi because that's what I did for a while in living in Nazareth, Nazareth Elite, which is a sister uh, city to the biggest Arab city in, within Israel. And all of a sudden my phone, my little phone rings. It's my daughter talking to me from Santa Cruz, California. I mean, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how can that be? Five, 6,000 uh, miles away and we can talk as if we are sitting right next to each other. Yeah. And, and I think that has enabled people also to express themselves more. And many people out of ignorance, mostly, or out of some terrible characteristics that they have, express hate, um, uh, dehumanize people that aren't white or or, are, uh, uh, or there are indigenous people to different countries. For example, the, in, uh, the Indian population in the United States and, and the reserves. It has come about in a period where so many changes are taking place so fast. Mm -hmm. On the one hand. On the other hand, because of that also, because of the communication revolution, we know more about it. You see, all this may have already existed, but nobody knew that it existed yeah. Yeah. because nobody yeah. expected it. They didn't get on TikTok or on, uh, on yeah. YouTube and, and, and put it out there. Mm -hmm. But they were already thinking it right. and doing things that probably were terrible. So yeah. maybe that's, we are more conscious of it because we're more exposed. Things are much more open. And I mean, something, somebody shoots somebody in, we're in Texas and, and uh, within five minutes later, we, we know it here in Israel. Right. Whereas if it would have happened 20 years ago, 50 years ago, till they uh, send the reporters, till they printed it, till the newspaper, you know? So I think this is, this is part of the process. Yeah, sure. Good, there are good parts to it, and there are not so good parts to it. Yeah. That's everything in life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about anti Semitism in general? What do, you, what do you think makes it different from other forms of hate and prejudice? What makes it unique? 
I think one of the unique things about this is that it's been around such a long, long time. Yeah. I mean, the, even before the pogroms of the, of the uh, early 1900s, the late 1800s, Jews were hated, were ostracized here, the Spanish, Spanish Inquisition. When was that? You had, and it goes back much further because mm -hmm. Jews are a little bit different. Yeah. The fact that not all Jews are different, that's a different thing. But they right. pick on, on the ones that are. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, one of the first things that Hitler picked on was the ultra Orthodox Jews that yeah. with, the, with the big payot and the black. Uh, hats and the uh, law and 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 uh, uh, hair and the uh, clothing they were so different. You could well, look look at them, look at these people, look how backward they are. They yeah. were actually weren't that backward. They're backward in some of their thinking and, and their behavior, but otherwise they were educated. Mm -hmm. They knew how to read and write long before the other Europeans around them knew it. So. I don't know if we can get totally rid of it. We're a little different. Maybe when the world will become a much safer place for all the minorities, including the Jews, mm -hmm. and now that we have our own country, it, it makes a certain balance. And let's hope that it will disappear as hope and, and hate and violence will leave us. I hope that my children, or, or maybe my grandchildren, or even my great-grandchildren <laughs> will come and make the world a better place. I have already two great-granddaughters. Two great-granddaughters? Two great-granddaughters, great-granddaughters. Wow. Yeah. I have 15 grandchildren and two great-granddaughters. That's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. That definitely is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So something else that I've noticed as the world is changing and evolving is that um, you, you see a lot of comparisons in the media and from politicians and different people kind of um, comparing you know, the coronavirus rules to the Holocaust, or this politician is Hitler-like, or that politician is Hitler-like. And I and and you kind of see it from both sides of the political parties. And and I wonder what what do you think about that? Do you think that's a dangerous thing or not? What do you feel about it? Well, to begin with, I absolutely reject the comparison. Mm -hmm. It's like comparing night and day. Hitler, Nazis, they made us wear a star in order to separate us, humiliate us, ostracize us, and subjugate us as human beings. It was not to protect us. Mm -hmm. It was to destroy us. The idea of being vaccinated, staying healthy, preventing yourself from getting sick and preventing others from getting sick from you because maybe you are a carrier, a carrier of the virus mm -hmm. or maybe you spoke to somebody and it rubbed off and you can rub it off. I think it's totally ridiculous yeah. to compare the two and to make that is the same. I mean that some people have said things on on, on uh, TikTok. It just shows how ignorant they are. Yeah. There was a there was a woman who said that that um, Hitler was the the ultra socialist communist Hitler <laughs> because the, the nationalist fascist. Uh, party was called uh, National Socialism 
it didn't mean social is not social. Right. Social as together. Yeah. Nazis together. We are the only people who are pure white and the upper class of all. You, including and first of all Jews, but not only Jews. Yeah. He didn't just kill six million Jews. He killed another 15 or caused the death of another at least 15 million other people, mm -hmm. including gypsies, homosexuals, uh, uh, whatever. Yeah. Whoever wasn't a pure, a, a pure German stuck 10 generations back couldn't be a real German. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of this is just simple ignorance. And I'm sorry that people get on there without first having the minimal idea what the modus vivendi, the real reason for Hitler and the, and, and the fascist was, was yeah. to rule Europe, all of Europe. They started by, uh, by us taking back Austria, then the Soviet land, then Czechia, then, then Hungary, Poland, Ukraine. Luckily, the Russians were able to stop them at Leningrad, yeah. but it wasn't easy. Sure, sure. And it's hard to know if people today that make those comparisons, if they are just so very ignorant to the facts of what happened, or if they're looking for shock value to get attention, or if it's a combination of both. <laughs> it's really hard it's to know. Some kind of combination. Look, you don't want to get, you don't want to get uh, vaccinated. Nobody's going to force you mm -hmm. to be vaccinated. But if you're not vaccinated, there are certain rules for people who are not vaccinated to protect the other people, and in some ways even you. So you have a choice. Well, so oftentimes I've heard people say that the Holocaust began with words, and um, and words eventually turned into action. So. Of course, the comparison strikes me to today of that you hear a lot of words or read a lot of words. So I, I wonder from your perspective, is it similar? Do you see differences from that? Does it alarm you to see the words? Do you, what, what do you think about it? <laughs> I, I, will, I will tell you something that I just told uh, uh, yesterday to somebody else. Words have meaning. Words have power. Words are our tools for communicating one with the other. Am I right? Yes. I remember in 1941, as a five-year-old or four and a half-year-old, we were living in Prague after we had gotten away from the Sudeten. And I was living with my grandfather, grandmother, mother and my father. And near our apartment, there was a park, little park, not a big one, not like Prospect Park or Central Park, mm -hmm. small park. Yeah. And my grandpa would take me there for walks and there were swings there and slides. And I remember there were swings. One was like in the shape of a canoe. And I love that swing. I would get in and my grandpa would uh, push me and I loved it. One day we came there. It was in early, no, it was in, in late 1940. It was in, in, in December or in November and it was really cold outside, I remember. And uh, I, we went to the park and I was about to run to, uh, to the swing. Mm -hmm. And then my grandpa said, no, 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 you can't go here. I said, why? There's a big sign there that said, Juden verboten, mm -hmm. Jews are not allowed. And, he, and, I, and I, I couldn't understand it. I said, why? What did I do? Well, wasn't I a, a good uh, boy? Did I do something wrong? Did I, uh, and I cried and I, uh, 
and you try to calm me down. And that's the meaning of words. That is how it's expressed. Words mean something. When the Germans posted every other day a new order on the bulletin boards in Prague, one day all Jews must bring in all their cameras. Another day all Jews have to bring in the typewriter. Another day all Jews must bring in any radio of any size, any shape, and so forth and so on. Yeah. All yeah. those were words. Yeah. And they caused a tremendous lot of harm and suffering. Yeah. Words have power. Do you think that the Holocaust is uh, such a horrific event that could be repeated anywhere, even in a country like the United States? <laughs> I hope not. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. I don't think anything like the Holocaust can and will occur again. Out of minor uh, genocides, yes. Yeah. I mean, minor, we say minor when 9,000 uh, Croatians were, uh, were shot dead uh, in Croatia. During, uh, during the uh, war in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. But uh, Hitler and his followers, and because they, there was a certain German um, characteristic to order and, and, and you know, where order by them is everything. Yeah. And therefore they were able to organize things. To kill six million people is not such a simple thing. Yeah. They yeah. had to be organized. They yeah. tried yeah. all kinds of things at the beginning. And it was too slow. It was too difficult. Yeah. They, 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 for example, they, they had people dig a huge ditch, and then the people that dug the ditch stood there, and soldiers had to kill them, shoot them. And they found that they had a number of soldiers that refused to do it, refused to do it. Mm -hmm. So they quickly learned they, they can, this is not a way that to, to get rid of six million people. Yeah. So, the organization, the, the dehumanization, systematically. I mean, if you can imagine German people, Germans who gave to the world people like Bach, Mozart, Haydn, Brahms, uh, Goethe, uh, I, uh, some of the greatest musicians and, and artists in the world. Yeah. These same people or relatives of these people would sit around a round table and discuss what is the fastest, cheapest, easiest, most effective way to kill the Jews. Mm -hmm. It's unimaginable. Yeah. Of educated because these were educated people. Yeah. These weren't people from the streets. Right. So that's my answer. I don't not think so. I don't I think I don't think so. They, we are not finished with having some minor genocides yet that will and may take place. And maybe are even taking place without our really knowing. Right. Right. In spite of everything. Right. But uh, also because of the technological, technological change in the world, you can't keep it secret. Right. And True. Much True. more difficult to keep it. You know, the, the Germans, people don't realize that the Jews in the camps, especially the camps that were not necessarily death camps, yeah. but just camps, working camps, starving camps, didn't know 
that people were being gassed at the rate of 9,000 people a day. They didn't know. We right. didn't know. I didn't, certainly as a little boy in a concentration, had no idea. And nobody in, in the, I don't think, knew. We all thought that it would be terrible to be sent to the East. I, I can tell you a little thing. For example, I had a great-grandmother, great-grandmother, who was 83 years old. She arrived in Theresienstadt, where I was uh, before, uh, for two years already, and uh, all the older people were in a barracks all separate from the rest. Uh, and then she spent, I think, two or three months there, and then she received a notification that she has to report to the train station the next day. And we knew that that's terrible. Yes. That's terrible. terrible where she was, but it's only going to be worse. And we came, my mother and I, and to, 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 the, to see her at the train. She was standing, she was a, a dainty, small little lady dressed in her finest the black dress, standing at the edge of the train station. Like, you know, in, in, in New York, you know, the subway stations in Brooklyn are sort of long and empty places. That's yeah. the way this was, not quite as big. And we came over to her and uh, we were troubled. We saw, she saw it, but we were troubled. And she said to us in German, but I'm saying it to in English, she said, oh, don't, don't worry. Well, don't, don't, uh, will that be okay? I'll be okay. What can they do with me? I'm an old lady. Well, I'm 83 years old. What do they want from me? Yeah. That was her mindset. Mm -hmm. That showed how, how totally the Germans managed to keep what they were doing a secret, not only from the rest of the world, but from people to whom they were doing it. You know, I've never heard anybody express that before. So it's very interesting and it's it's just unbelievable. And you know, she was sent to a place called Treblinka. Which yeah. We know now was yeah. absolute death. Sure, sure. For everybody who came there. Yeah. Well, besides the fact that now our technology is different, so information travels so quickly, what, um, what else do you attribute, um, I hate to use this word, but the success of the Germans, um, what do you attribute their success in terms of convincing the whole country to kind of be in line with certain things, um, even convincing prisoners, as you're saying, to be in line with certain things. What, what were they doing that allowed that, do you think? Or what was the biggest thing that they were doing that allowed it? I, I, I think what Hitler uh, managed to do, you see, if you know a little bit of the history, in 19, remember that the Germans weren't just the Germans. The Germans was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, mm -hmm. which was Hungary, uh, Austria, Germany, and a couple of others. That all oh, was a huge area, and they lost the war in mm -hmm. 1918. Right. And then there was a big conference, and the Germans were stripped of many of these lands and new countries were born. Yeah. Czechoslovakia was one of the countries that was born. Yeah. And uh, the Germans lost a tremendous lot of natural resources and had to pay heavy fines to all the countries that they were at fault with. And um, they were pretty much unhappy and suffering, not suffering to the point of death, but uh, they weren't anymore the rulers of the world, of their world. Yeah. So Hitler lucked into this, into this 
being stripped of power, being stripped of resources. This is all ours, this belongs to us. And if, if you remember, the first thing that he did, he did was Austria. He didn't call it, he didn't call it a conquer, uh, conquest, called it Anschluss. Anschluss means bringing, uh, bringing them back together. Okay. And uh, there were enough Nazis in Austria that said, oh, oh we come back to, to mother, mother uh, Germany. And he, the German people were hungry for, <laughs> maybe hungry, literally so, but were hungry for success, for some hope to get out of this terrible state that they were in. And they were not in a good state. So that was a good beginning. And uh, promises of, 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 of uh, riches and, and power, and he used everything in his power that he could. He was very um, clever, and he had people with him who totally adored him. Yeah. Even though he, as a person, was a failure. He, by the way, he, he, he didn't uh, succeed in getting into an art school mm -hmm. in Vienna. And he was actually born in, in Austria, not in Germany. Yeah. So, yes, the German people succumbed to this. And mm -hmm. sometimes people ask me, do you forgive the German people? And I say to them, I'm sorry. I can't forgive the German people. It's the German people who allowed him to come to power and to do what he did. And yeah. I'm surprised today, I, was, I didn't realize this till a little while ago, that many of the worst camps weren't in Poland or in Hungary, they were actually in Germany. Yeah. In Germany. Uh, and I didn't even realize how many of them were. So if the Germans then say they didn't know, that's a lie. Or I would put it more coarsely, bullshit. Mm -hmm. because, <laughs> because the smoke and the smell and the shooting and the sheer nature of the size of these places, many, many people knew something was going on that they may not have agreed with, yeah. but they didn't do anything about it. Right, right. And at many times, it was simply out of fear, of course. Yeah. Fear yeah. was a very strong weapon. Sure. As we know, fear can do tremendous lot of damage. And uh, if, you, if you, if you, I mean, I give you a, a little idea that, for example, in, in Prague, when we were living there and uh, we had a little radio, we wanted to listen to the news from outside of Prague. And when an order came to bring in, to uh, take the radio and, uh, and uh, uh, get rid of it and deliver it to the police station, which was controlled, by the German uh, army, my, my grandfather said to my father, Oi, please, uh, let's, we'll hide it something. And my, my, my father said, no, 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 please. We can, they will find it. They will come find it. And, and why? Because they were neighbors. If they could hear, they yeah. could report, they come and they find the radio. They don't only take the radio, they take your entire family yeah. and you never see them again. Yeah. So fear is a terrible, terrible thing. It certainly isn't. I'm sure it uh, has the ability to make people do things they never, you know, would imagine that That's they right. would That's do. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, well, and human beings are so complicated. And um, I wonder if, you know, in all- They're also gullible. They're also what? Gullible. Yeah, gullible, yes. I mean, gullible. 
There, there are a lot of things. <laughs> well, and, and I wonder, um, did you ever see, when you were in the camp yourself, did you ever see kindness, even, even from a soldier that, or a, a guard, did you ever see a glimmer of kindness? I, I remember one incident, uh, uh, us kids were, oh, oh, first of all, everybody was hungry all the time. Yeah. You can imagine being hungry 24-7. I don't know if you can. I can hardly imagine it myself, but we were hungry yeah. all the time. We were always searching for some place to uh, find food. And sometimes we found uh, uh, food because we worked helping, let's say, to unload a truck of, of uh, br uh, breads, loaves of bread we had to get on our hand, bring it from the truck and bring it to the, the storeroom. And then I remember um, I was working one time uh, um, taking care of uh, the uh, horses of the officers of the Germans. And, uh, you know, there were incidents where here and there, I mean, each one of us kids who we were eight, nine years old, met us brushing and cleaning and feeding and bringing water to, and uh, the officers sometimes, uh, if you did a good job, they would uh, give you a candy or a piece of sugar or somehow without anybody. It didn't happen to me, but I know it did happen to a couple of the other boys. Yeah. But also if you didn't do a good job, you got a kick in your behind. Right, right. So those, there were some humans there too, I'm right. sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's something that I've always wondered because uh, it's hard to imagine <laughs> that there was kindness everywhere. Incidents, uh, the incident. The problem was that sometimes that kindness was found out by the commanding officer mm -hmm. or one of the soldiers who tell the officer about this guy did this or that. Um, it was the end of that person. Right. So more fear. More, more fear, fear driven. More fear. Yeah. Well, Definitely. yeah. You know, I can tell you, for example, that uh, at the very beginning, when we arrived in the concentration camp in 1941, uh, um, they gave each person a postcard printed to be sent to their families outside of the camp. And it said, we are fine, everything's okay, love you, bye. And you sign it. Mm -hmm. and you send it, which of course was really, a, uh, once again, a lie. Yeah. We were far from okay. So there were a few young people, mostly young boys, maybe 18, 20 years old, who wanted to send real letters to their relatives, what was happening. And uh, they were caught and they were hung. Mm. And how did they find it out? Because one or two of the guards, they had bribed somehow and passed it. And they found out through the guards who the, who the young people were, and they were hung right in front of us. Wow, wow. And so it was dangerous to be kind. Yeah, yeah. Kind but I'm true. sure there were some that did manage to be human, but not too many, yeah. not enough. Wow. Well, what about when you were liberated and um, and went back home, so to speak? Were were you faced with anti-Semitism? Were you faced with hatred? Were did you face kindness? What happened? No, no to the first part of your question. Mm -hmm. 
I, we didn't face uh, hatred. We didn't face anti-Semitism. We returned to our apartment first in Prague and waited to see if anybody would come back. And we found out that nobody would, and my father amongst them. And then we went back to where I was born, Carlo Ivari in the Sudetin, and we waited and we waited. And uh, I started going to school for the first time at the age of 10. And then we emigrated to the United States in 1948, landing in Brooklyn, New York, uh, because my great aunt had guaranteed our being in, in the United States. And the Americans demanded that anybody, even if it's a survivor, it must have somebody, family member or somebody who will give them an affidavit, a sign that they are responsible for them. Wow. Financially and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we waited and then we got the notification. And in 1948, we arrived in Brooklyn, New York. Well, um, let's let's jump ahead to Israel then, because I, I remember reading from your book that you were raised in a secular family. So wh what impassioned you so much about Israel? What made you want to go there so much? To have my own country. <laughs> Don't we all want to belong to, to have our own country? Mm -hmm. Why should the Jews not have their own country? Mm -hmm. Why should the Jews have to be dispersed over the entire globe? I felt we have a right to a country. Yeah. Why specifically this part? Because history, a history of 2,000 years or more has more or less tied us to this part of the universe. Mm -hmm. And I felt we should come here, build it, and make a land for the Jewish people to come to. Mm -hmm. Not all the Jewish people will come. Some will, some won't, but at least there'll be a home for the yeah. Jewish people. And I was totally, uh, uh, totally committed to that. Even when I went to America, I was committed to it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 10 years after I arrived in America, in 1959, I came to Israel. Yeah. And I well, the fields, and I milked the cows, right. and I went by behind them. <laughs> well, um, you, you know, I mean, it's a, a big cause of the conversation today, uh, as I'm sure you know, that creates a lot of um, anti-Semitic talk. And I, I felt like it would be interesting to have you explain to, to, you know, to everybody that listens um, about the conflict of the Jews coming back to Israel, um, some that remain there always, but um, others coming back there, and and the whole conflict between the Palestinian people that were there. It's it's something that you see a lot of people arguing about and feeling very passionate about. And could you just explain from your point of view that kind of um, the situation? Okay, <laughs> you realize this is a very tricky question and very difficult to answer. Yeah. Because today to be a Zionist, uh, you may as well be a fascist. Yeah. That's not true. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. Well, let's take a step, a step back for one second. Will you explain what a Zionist is? Because I, I think a lot of people either don't know okay. or they're misinformed. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, Zionism, Zion, comes from the word Zion. It, it is in the Tanakh, in the Bible, the return to Jerusalem. Just remember that we were dispersed because the Romans, the Greeks, the Romans conquered this area and ruled over the entire area. And at one point, they sent 
who are, whoever was a Jew away to different people, different parts of the world. There was a dispersion, but in in especially in terms of the religious religious Jews, they in many prayers and many festivals and uh, and and, and uh, they always mention the return to Zion, the return to Zion, which meant this area, exactly which area, how big, how much, that we can argue from now till doomsday. But I guess the world in 1947, 48, came to the conclusion to the United Nations that after considering some kind of solution to the Jewish problem, they decided, yes, the Jews should also have their own country. Not a very big one, but a small one. And if you ever have a chance to see the plan of the partition plan of, uh, of what was then the British mandate, because this wasn't Palestine. This was a British mandate. The Brit British army and the British government ruled over this entire area. Mm -hmm. Between the British, the French, and anybody else? No, Americans were in Myanmar. Just mainly the British and the French. They were ruling this entire area. And there were local settlers here who were not Jews, who were Arab, but a great deal of the land was also owned by very rich Arab absentee, uh, absentee landowners. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the uh, good part of the land was bought actually from these absentee landowners, but not all of it. But in the, in the partition plan, a very a small part of this country they declared to be the Jewish homeland. Mm -hmm. And the Arab countries around it, not so much the Arabs sitting, living here, but mm -hmm. mostly the Arabs around it, Iraq, Syria, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, um, was Egypt, did not accept the plan. The, the Israeli ruling body that lived here and was established already did accept it. And that's why, even though there were Jews living here who said, no, this is terrible. This is a terrible plan. And it was a terrible plan. I, I, I don't have the map yet, but you take a look at the partition plan map and you'll see how ridiculous it is. But the, the United Nations uh, accepted the plan mm -hmm. and both the Americans and the Russians accepted, agreed on it, and we became a country. The problem was that the Arab countries surrounding us didn't accept it. And they had big armies, lots of ammunition, lots of uh, uh, guns, and attacked us mm -hmm. from one, two, three, four, five different directions. And we had very few arms, very little in comparison to what the Arab arms are. So they said, <laughs> it'll take us a week, maybe two weeks to drive them into the sea. That was their, that was their uh, uh, goal, mm -hmm. to finish us off once and for all. No Jews, no Israelis, no problem, right? No. Yeah. It's all the Jewish problem. The only problem was the Israelis that were here were tough, were brave, and fought back. And even though there was an arms embargo on the Middle East, 
which essentially affected only Israel. Yeah. But Israel had no out, no ways of going out, only the sea. So luckily, the Czech Republic was the only country that helped the Jewish, uh, the small little Israeli uh, country, and a small little field in the Jezebel Valley. Mm -hmm. And they brought us ammunition, rifles, a few machine guns, a few small mortar uh, cannons, not cannons, mortars. And uh, also new immigrants arrived from all the different places that the British had prevented from coming, mm -hmm. mostly in Cyprus. So very quickly, we held them back and then pushed them back. And for till 1967, we had, we had a much bigger country than, than uh, the United Nations uh, uh, partition plan. But I felt okay. I personally <laughs> felt this is okay with me. Because Even it though, happened from war, because you're saying... Uh, yes, it's a, and it's, it's a lie. I mean, I want to make it very clear. Our, our hands, our Israeli hands, our Jewish hands are not flawless, are not without having committed a number of terrible acts during war. Yeah. During the war, during the fighting. That is true. We know it. I'm sorry for it. I regret it. But wars are not clean, never. There are always terrible things that happen in wars and we most of the time don't know about it. Don't know about it. 20, 30, 50 years later, when they open the archives, you always find, find out, wow, this happened? These, our, our sisters, brothers, sons, cousins, did something so terrible? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. So we are not guiltless. But the fact is, today, and then the 67 war altogether. <laughs> That's another story in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, I want to go on line with you and tell you, I feel that we have to leave the West Bank, the occupied terrorists, maybe not 100%. Maybe partially. Maybe we have to figure out some ways of of the of some of those settlements there staying there but being part of Israel uh, with roads. Some human arrangement has to be found for the Palestinians to have their country, mm -hmm. for Jews and Israelis to have ours. We have here a million and a half of. Arab citizens of the state of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. They may not all be happy, but they're having a good, they're making a pretty good living, and they have the have the standard of living is probably, if not 10 times or more higher than any of the Arab states surrounding Israel. Well, yes, which is a good point that I'm sure many people don't realize. I think um, what also is interesting about you is that you, you know, you have the ability, which I feel like a lot more people used to have the ability, but to understand nuances that you can, you can feel um, some criticism towards a government, even a government that- oh, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> 
And but I think it's very hard. Like we've lost the sense of nuances. It's it, things have become very black or white, and um, and people have gotten very impatient with listening and talking. <laughs> there is no black and white. There's a hell of a lot of gray. Yeah. Well, um, that's all so interesting, and I loved hearing it from your point of view. And I kind of wanted to wrap up things just by asking you a, a few little questions about yourself. Um, you have such a long um, life, filled life, and I want to know, and you continue to have, and I want to know, why do you think that is? What's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I can even explain that. I, it's just me refusing to give up hope. Look, yeah. I had cancer twice. The first cancer I had was of the colon, and it was stage number four. Wow. Stage number four colon, <laughs> not too many people. It was uh, 20 years ago more than 20 years ago, uh, survived. I survived it. And uh, I had uh, a year of chemotherapy. And here I am. Yeah, yeah. And well, then I had a second time cancer. And yeah. still I'm here. And by the way, just to give it a little something special, the second cancer, I was, was of the bladder. And I was treated by a... Muslim Arab, wonderful urologist. Mm -hmm. He kept me alive. Yeah. And in the end, he's a, he's the reason he didn't operate on me in the end, but he is the one who kept me alive and said, you know, we're going to do this. And we did. <laughs> That's the lovely detail to the story, and I and I just love the concept of hope. So that's a, a great answer. Um, and, and then I guess my final question would be, uh, and maybe it taps onto this question or this answer, but what would your advice be to younger people if you could only give them one piece of advice? Never give up, stay hopeful. Yeah, yeah. I had a feeling you were gonna say that. <laughs> oh, really? I, I am, I'm, I'm very, sad and appalled by so many young people taking their lives. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's very that sad. means they gave up all hope of somehow overcoming their hardships. And I don't belittle their hardships. But they gave up hope. Yeah. Don't give up hope. If I can go through a concentration camp, cancer and whatnot, and a couple of other things which I don't want to talk about. You can do it too. I yeah. mean, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. And Thank yeah, you. yeah. And those were all my questions. I love, love talking to you and meeting you. It's, um, you know, just something that I never dreamed would get to happen. So I feel very lucky. I feel lucky to be able to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. I can't wait to paint you, by the way. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, no, I cannot. And this will really, you know, All listening right. back to this interview is really going to help me with that. So, very good.